Welcome to this special episode of The Trident in conjunction with our recent 2024 Maritime Symposium, Exploring Our Maritime Strategies, held on 24 and 25 June. Today we're discussing the Houthi attacks on global shipping vessels and U.S. warships in the Bab El Mandeb Strait. We're talking today to Captain Joe Baggett, uh, United States Navy. He's a former senior staff officer that has also served on a number of U.S. naval vessels, including the USS Clagring, the USS Stout, the USS Barry, USS Anzio. He was also commanding officer of the destroyer, the Truxton, and the Ticonderoga uh, guided uh, missile class, USS uh, Cruiser, USS Monterey. And he's had short duties, including service on the staff of the U.S. Naval Forces of Central Command, U.S. Fifth Fleet as lead exercise planner, and he was the operations officer for the deployable training division on the joint staff of the J-7. Most recently, he served as chief of staff and also ran the Military Operations Center for Fifth Fleet NAVSENT. And he currently serves as the commanding officer of the U.S. Naval Surface Warfare School. And Joe, we appreciate you joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. We're also joined by Nadwa Al Darsawi. I may have gotten that yeah, right, yeah. I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, a veteran researcher, conflict analyst, and policy advisor who has 20 years of experience in Yemen and the Middle East. She's a non resident scholar at the Middle East Institute and a fellow at the Center on Armed Groups. She advises policymakers, donors, humanitarian organizations, and her insights are widely published by top think tanks in the United States and Europe. In her previous roles, Nadwa served as a senior conflict advisor to the World Food Program, a Yemen country director at the Center for Civilians in Conflict. She was a founding director at Partners Yemen, a MENA advisor at Partners Global, and a senior program manager at the National Democratic Institute. Nadwa's research focuses on Yemeni and regional conflict dynamics, including the impact on U.S. foreign policy, internationally led peace efforts, counterterrorism, and aid on regional security. Thank you. And we're also joined by Mr. Evan Kurt. And Evan is the Deputy Commissioner of Maritime Affairs, the Republic of the Marshall Islands. In 2012, Mr. Kurt joined International Registries Incorporated Maritime Services Group as the Maritime Security and Investigations Coordinator and was later promoted to Ship Security Manager. In 2021, Mr. Kurt was promoted to Vice President, Maritime Security, and deals with ISPS code and related maritime security issues and other initiatives including piracy, armed robbery against ships, maritime terrorism, stowaways, contraband smuggling, and maritime cyber risk management. He serves as a delegate to many maritime security working groups coordinated and supported by the shipping industry associations, also NATO, coalition naval forces, and the International Maritime Organization. Evan, welcome. So today's episode we've entitled The Bob El Mandab Strait and the Red Sea. And maybe we could start uh, for our audience uh, this morning by exploring who exactly the Houthis are and what it is that they want. Uh, but first, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Um, the Houthis are a Zaidi Shia group, a uh, rebel group, uh, based in Yemen. They, um, they believe in a divine right to rule to uh, Prophet Muhammad descendants, and that's when, where the leader of the movement um, and key leaders of the movement um, come from. Um, they're also influenced by the Iranian Revolution, and in particular, the concept of wilayat al-faqih, or the guardianship of the jurist, which means there is a supreme leader um, who has the ultimate political and religious authority. Uh, they seek to establish a theocracy in Yemen and, um, and beyond. They're also a member of Iran's axis of resistance, and probably now the jewel in the crown of the axis of resistance. So, they, so this is a religious, ideologically driven group uh, I think uh, you said at the symposium that they were, um, they believed in the Mahdi, which is kind of a messianic figure yeah. that would come back towards the end of time, and many of their political ambitions are quite broad. Yes, so their, their political ambitions are not only Yemen. They, they seek to take Mecca, and then their, uh, their goal is to uh, take Jerusalem, destroy Israel, and establish an Islamic government 
place in Jerusalem well, um, that is global in nature. So they seek to expand beyond the Middle East mm. eventually. And some of their attacks in the Red Sea are being motivated, or at least um, by their own admission, um, due to some of the conflict in Gaza. Uh, in part, yes, but the Houthis um, are really good at seizing opportunities to escalate. What the Houthis want in the in the region is a, um, a perpetual state of war. They need war because they need to build their jihadist army, um, and they need to create instability uh, in order to push the U.S. out of the region, and then that they believe will help them achieve their objectives and, and long-term goal. And how many fighters are we talking about? So the leader of the movement says they've recruited um, over 380, 368,000 fighters. Mm. Um, that might be an exaggerated number, but they probably have, um, experts say they have anywhere between 180 and 2,000, 200,000 fighters. Okay. And the conflict that's going on in Yemen, which borders the, the Red Sea, um, how long have they, is they, would you characterize that as a civil war? And if so, they're fighting against the Yemeni government or the national government of Yemen for how long? And why have they been so difficult to defeat? The Houthis have been fighting the government since 2004. Um, and um, it's the, they've been difficult to defeat not because they're popular or strong, but because their um, rivals have not been consistent. So when the Saudi-led coalition intervened in Yemen, the Saudis Saudis, Saudi officials uh, mentioned to American officials that it would be a two-week air bombardment and that will be it. The objective was to reinstate, to end the Houthis coup and reinstate the Yemeni government, um, you know, control of the capital of Sana'a. The Houthis took the capital in September 2014. Um, and that didn't happen. They underestimated the Houthis. Um, and then there was no strategy in the war in the first place because, well, um, the, the Saudis thought they could defeat the Houthis in two weeks. And then after that, uh, there was no consistency. So, like, the Saudis did not provide enough support and consistent support for the Yemeni government forces to defeat the Houthis. Uh, but at the same time, the Saudis and the Emiratis had different objectives in Yemen. The Emiratis supported southern forces and focused on uh, sort of, you know, establish influence in Yemen coastline. Um, the Saudis did not support Yemeni forces. The UAE-backed forces sort of clashed with the Yemeni government forces. So you have, like, two regional allies at the Yemeni government sort of um, supporting rival forces that are supposed to be fighting the Houthis, but now they were, they were sort of undermining each other, and that played into the hands of the Houthis. But the more important one is the peace process, because the peace process... Understand, as in, understandably focused on establishing truce and reaching a political settlement, um, the UN-led peace process. But what happened was the UN kept putting pressure on the Saudis and the Yemeni government to mm. stop their offensive. At the same time, they did not have leverage on the Houthis. Um, and so that ultimately um, you know, led to the Stockholm Agreement in 2018. The Stockholm Agreement forced the Yemeni government, government forces to, sto to, to stop taking the Hodeida seaport from the Houthis um, and forced them to be on the offensive. So they've been on the on, on the defensive, sorry, since then. At the same time, the Houthis exploited that opportunity. They regrouped and they made significant military gains uh, in the rest of Yemen and now they're stronger militarily, you know. So they've Yemen. also taken over a fair amount of the country they, at this point uh, and are closer to the coast. They they, they control the north, they control Hodeida seaport. Uh, they continue to receive weapon shipment um, and assistance from, from Iran, and at the same time, um, there are no um, effective measures to sort of even mitigate that. So let's talk about what kind of uh, weapons they do have. Obviously, we're interested in attacks into the, the Red Sea itself. Um, what, what are they attacking ships with, and where are they getting those weapons? Yeah, good, good question, David. Again, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, so what I saw there, you know, during my time as the Maritime Operations Center Director, uh, they obviously have a family of, uh, of UAVs, uh, long-range, uh, one-way attack UAVs. Uh, the most uh, widely used thus far to date is the, the CASO-4. Again, very long-range, unmanned aerial vehicle. But this is not like a, it's not like a 
drone that I would buy at Walmart or something. This is much larger, much larger, much much uh, longer range. Yeah, you're talking man, 15 to 20 foot wingspan, thousand kilometers. Uh, it, it can travel great distances, and it's got a pretty significant payload on the front. You know, okay. as, we, as we've seen um, throughout the recent attacks and, and and all the ones leading back to when this all started, uh, when they impact a merchant vessel, the, the damage that those things can cause. And then uh, the Houthis are not launching these one at a time; they're launching them in swarms. Uh, okay. and, uh, so. Uh, We've seen that on several uh, instances, uh, the large-scale attacks that they are able to um, to uh, swarms of you eat unmanned aerial how many? vehicles. Uh, you so five or no, 50 so I'll, or? I'll take you back to the night of uh, October 19th uh, when uh, the first engagement from the USS Kearney and a large-scale um, um, attack from the Houthis to the north uh, was in the in the 20s, in the 20s and 30s. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, and we've seen that several times and several times. So a family of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that they utilize, uh, they also have a family of anti-ship crews and uh, ballistic missiles. Um, we've seen that. Um, and what we saw in the past and, and still continue to see today is that the Houthis will utilize the UAVs to kind of um, <clears throat> zero in their targeting, if you will. They're still indiscriminate targeting, but they would utilize the UAVs if they weren't using, using them to attack. They would use them to refine their targeting. And then and uh, shortly behind the UAV would uh, be a cruise missile or sure. a ballistic missile. And, and, and I call them, sorry, Please. I call them, you know, ballistic missiles. Uh, but we have to understand what's ha happening in the theater. They're not flying a ballistic trajectory. They're not going exoatmospheric. Mm -hmm. It's the speed associated with it. But the Houthis have depressed the trajectory, and these missiles are getting out to the battle space fairly quickly. Um, to quantify that, if you look at where the ships are operating in the merchant traffic lane, if a ballistic missile is fired from the typical launching points that we've seen, um, the ships have anywhere from 15 to 20 seconds to react. Wow. Evan, do you, do you, can you tell us about how, at least in the narrow part of the street, what, what's the what's the maritime distance here uh, across that street? Is it? Uh, well, it's about eighteen. About eighteen miles, miles mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. nautical miles. Yeah. And um, how long has it been since these major attacks have been going on? At least in this most recent peace episode in the Red Sea. Well, the first uh, attack was uh, November 19th, I mm -hmm. believe. Um, that was the Galaxy Leader. Of this yeah. past year, of 2023. Um, so, yes, 2023. 2023. Okay. 2023. Right. And um, of the recent Houthi attacks. Um, that was on the Galaxy Leader, and it was uh, a helicopter that stormed the vessel. Mm -hmm. um, right, so there's some YouTube videos up uh, that they've used for some propaganda purposes or whatever. So I, I think many of, a lot of listeners may have seen pieces or parts of that of them uh, coming onto the ship or, or getting onto the ship in that regard. Yep. I think okay. they made music videos even. <laughs> but um, um, the attacks have continued pretty steadily since then. There have been some lulls, but uh, not very many. A total of uh, 77. Mm -hmm. um, about half of them were hit. Um, the rest were attempts. So, mm -hmm. so in terms of effectiveness, uh, that's a pretty large number of attacks. All the hits at this point have been onto commercial vessels. We've not had any hits on U.S. warships. Correct. Partly because the defensive measures of those ships are either shooting these drones down in protection of other ships or in protection of their own battles. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's funny. You know, Evan <laughs> talked about it. And the first attack, you know, was October 19th, uh, and I was, you know, the Houthis attacking um, to the north, and uh, Carney was successful in engaging those contacts. Along, it was really a joint effort because the Air Force uh, was successful as well. Um, um, but that was October 19th, and as Evan talked about, November 19th was the first attack on a merchant vessel. Um, and then you, know, we, you asked a question uh, earlier, just to, you know, expand upon that a little bit. Their, you know, their, their, their rhetoric at the beginning was we were doing this in response to Israel invasion of Gaza, of Gaza. right? Okay. But and so that we're, therefore we're going to attack any merchant vessel with any Israeli affiliation. But what we've seen in the attacks that 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 it, they utilize that very loosely, <laughs> and it is uh, indiscriminate targeting now, which makes it very very difficult. But yeah, there's been no successful attacks against U.S. Navy warships. And how dangerous are these attacks to both? So how many ships have actually, so the number of ships have been hit? 39, I think. Some ships mm -hmm. have sunk? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, the third is, I believe, sinking yeah. uh, as we speak, yeah. but uh, two have sunk. So, so it's tremendously uh, recent events. I mean, even up to the last week or two, they've escalated attacks, I believe, and they continue to attack vessels uh, throughout. Is that um, so? We're talking about things 
that may be happening while we're doing the broadcast. That's right. That's right. And I think what we've seen too with other uh, weapon system that I, that I didn't get to in my, in my early answer was they're starting to utilize their unmanned surface vessels, which have uh, really changes the, the dynamic there. And I think the most recent merchant vessel that was hit in the sinking was hit by an unmanned surface vessel. So you think about an explosive laden unmanned surface boat that hits the ship at the waterline. So it's almost like <clears throat> a drone. They've got like some sort of uncrewed vessel mm -hmm. and they're using it as kind of a man or an unmanned torpedo exactly on the surface right. exactly of right. sorts mm -hmm. blows up at the ship line or, or something That's and right. it has killed some seafarers as That's well. Right. Yeah, one seafarer died on the most recent attack, or the one with the USV. Um, he was actually in the engine room and, and um, drowned. Mm. Um, the, the remote controlled drone boat, uh, if you will, is mm. uh, actually controlled by another, well, they believe it's controlled by another skiff um, close by. So... Um, Okay. Let's go back to thinking about the U.S. warships here. So I know you mentioned the USS Kearney. Uh, USS Kearney is a uh, Arleigh Burke uh, destroyer. Um, I know you've commanded one of these ships. Um, tell us a little bit about that. It's probably one of our most capable naval platforms. Yeah. Um, and it's not probably not the only ship. Uh, what else has the U.S. done from a Navy standpoint to try to protect shipping in the Gulf? Yeah, so first and foremost, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're doing this uh, by, with, and through our partners as well. I think uh, things uh, <clears throat> got, I don't want to say better, you know, because, yes, the U.S. Navy has been highly successful in the operations that we've conducted in the Red Sea thus far. But when the Operations Prosperity Guardian uh, stood up and it became a partnered effort, uh, I think that's when the game really changed uh, because we all see the impacts to the global trade of what's happening in the Red Sea, and it's not just happening to the United States. Um, but to your question, though, yes, our, our guided missile destroyer is the, the workhorse of the fleet, but we've had submarines in the area, we've had cruisers in the area, and, of course, the aircraft carrier, Ike, uh, and, and utilizing the aircraft from the Ike um, really changed the game as well, um, making us a more effective force. Uh, but the guided missile destroyer is from um, Carney, who's just an an example, but you got Mason, Gravely, Thomas Hudner, several have been out there doing doing uh, great work. And uh, to your point, um, we, we've been highly successful, and we're we're batting a thousand right now. But you know, when 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 the men and women that wear the cloth of our nation, and you know, their lives are at risk because the Houthis are targeting U.S. warships, um, we have to be we have to be a, a thousand percent. So know, the Aegis successful. system, which is usually located on one of the destroyers or maybe right. a cruiser, are we using that system, Absolutely. or is that? And so that's part of this. Uh, air cap from F-18s off the carrier mm -hmm. deck, um, so everything's in play. Absolutely. Uh, how close do these attacks get? Um, and there, there are multiple systems, or for defensive purposes, or no? Yeah, there definitely are. So I mean, uh, our, our warships are built with uh, you know a degree of redundancy to make sure there just isn't one weapon system. Uh, so uh, layered layer defense is something that we preach um, uh, just to protect different ships, but also uh, using different weapon systems to protect own ship. Uh, so yeah, the Aegis weapon system is playing a significant role, uh, but when you um, tie that together with uh, the aviation systems from the from the carrier, uh, make a pretty formidable defense. Um, and the, the weapon of last resort? Uh, something called the uh, close-in weapon system, CWIS. Uh, we've seen that in action a couple times, unfortunately, but it's successful. So it's like a very high-speed Gatlin gun. Exactly. That's kind of trying to shred anything that's close to the ship. That's exactly right. It's fully. You can put it in full autonomous mode, and it'll search and search. And when it sees a threat that it evaluates as a threat to the ship, uh, it'll track it and it'll engage it, and it won't stop shooting until it's no longer there. But you don't really want to hear that going off. We don't off want to hear that going off because yeah. that means that the attack has been successful enough to to get close proximity. That's right. To the ship itself. That's right, and that is the last resort. If that weapon system doesn't doesn't hit, and I mean, there are soft kill options that you can try to, to you know, persuade the weapon away from the ship. Uh, but if you hear that Gatling gun going off, that, that means that you're your last resort. So they've uh, used a variety of different weapons. Are they making these? If not, where are they getting uh, these weapons? Are they manufacturing them in the country? Um, in some cases, or are they getting them by sea? Where, where are they getting these weapons? So when the Houthis took the capital of Sana'a, they took control of military bases. Um, and so they've inherited all the state weapons that were mm. in the north. And that includes the weapons that were given uh, to the Yemeni government by the U.S. to counter terrorism. But they also, most of their weapons come from Iran. Um, and they come through Harida Seaport. They come through land as well, via Oman, uh, via smuggling routes. Um, uh, uh, 
IRGC commanders on the ground with the Houthis um, have helped them develop weapon manufacturing, um, weapon assembling. So that includes. So I just want to drone. clarify. So the IRGC is the uh, Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps Guard. from the Guard, yeah. Iranian group, and so they have advisors. So Iran basically has advisors. Uh, helping the Houthis in this regard. Yeah, they've, they've had uh, IRGC advisors Throughout for, for, at least, okay. for at least the past decade and before Hezbollah as well. Okay. Um, so they, they, so Iran has provided the Houthis with weapon manufacturing uh, capabilities. Um, and so a lot of the weapons that come in, they, they're assembled in Yemen, uh, including yeah. drones and, uh, and missiles. And are these, so they're not super expensive, probably not as expensive as some of the pieces and parts, some of the missiles that we're using to shoot down right. some of these larger drones. Right, yeah, the average standard okay. missiles are around two million. Okay. Mm -hmm. And why is it so difficult to interdict either the assembly parts that are coming in um, or the missiles themselves or other kind of weapons? Um, obviously, we're there's been some effort to interdict yeah. at least to the maritime routes that lead into the major port. I know you've talked about this uh, with Commodore Fryer at the symposium some. Why is this such a difficult problem set in terms of uh, trying to stop, uh, allow aid in uh, for humanitarian purposes, but to stop the smuggling of particularly weapons in this case that could be used in the Red Sea? Yeah, good question, Dave. It's a challenge. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that we are solely, you know, wholly focused on there uh, in Fifth Fleet. And, uh, you know, if you look at the track record, we have been um, successful in interdicting uh, vessels. Uh, but obviously, uh, things are, are continuing to get through. And, and why is that? I, I, tyranny of distance is what I would uh, chalk it up to. You're, you're talking about an area from the from the Arabian Gulf to the to the Suez, about 3 million square miles, wow. uh, which is large. And for those, you know, to, to put it in context, that's roughly the size of the United States, right? So if you take something roughly the size of the United States, and on any given day, you know, you're trying to police that area with four or five, we'll, we'll call it even 10 ships, right? 10 ships that um, can on top speed do 30 knots, which is 30, 35 miles an hour, right? So you, you liken that with 10 cop cars that can do 30, 45 miles an hour trying to police the entire United States. And oh, by the way, the enemy that's carrying the bad stuff is driving the same color car, the same type of car <laughs> as everybody else. So what I mean by that is if you look uh, at the fishing vessels uh, in, in that area, they're called dows. Uh, um, and that is a very, very common type of fishing vessel. Uh, and literally hundreds, if not thousands, of these underway every single day. Well, that's what we're. So those are. That's what so there's using. a ton of those out on the exactly. water. Uh, you don't know which ones are being used for smuggling, exactly. which ones are actually fishing. Exactly. And it's very difficult, even from an intelligence standpoint, to even know what's on each one of these. You don't have time to board every single one of them. That's right. You're operating, you're operating a huge expanse That's of right. water. That's right. Now, the intel community has been very, very uh, uh, successful and very helpful in us and the ones that we were successful in interdicting. But, yeah, it's just the, the, the large number. And, again, being out there and, and the intel community goes, hey, it's on a, a, it's a, a Dow. It's on right? the fishing <laughs> that's exactly somewhere. Right. That's it's exactly right. Somewhere in this near vicinity, that's there's, right. there's that's something right. that's coming on one of these that's right, and, and they vessels, do the best so. to try to narrow it down as best right. as they can. And, and most of the time, they're very, very, they're all the time they're really good at it. But most of the time, they're really successful. And other times, uh, you know, it gets much, much harder once the vessel, you know, gets underway and gets into the mix with all the other dows, trying to pick it out from the one they told us was the bad one. And then you just look at the distance that we're trying to cover. The amount of cop cars, if you will, that we would need to cover that entire area is just, uh, you know, enormous. So that's why you see a lot of efforts now uh, championed by uh, Admiral Cooper and the team out there on, uh, with unmanned technology trying to cover that water space and increase our maritime domain awareness. And I think not only some of your colleagues were talking about the fact that once upon a time there was more, there was an inspection regime that was set up under mm -hmm. UN mandate so that some or maybe all of the ships are supposed to go somewhere like Djibouti, get inspected before they arrive yeah. at the port in Yemen, but that's not always happening. So there, there was uh, two inspection mechanisms, uh, one still in, in effect. So the Saudis had their own inspection mechanism, mm. the, uh, So and it was relatively effective, but the Saudis, since uh, April 2022, when the Saudis um, 
started direct uh, negotiations with the Houthis, um, the Saudis uh, dismantled their inspection mechanism. Mm -hmm. There's also the UN inspection mechanism on them. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with the UN inspection mechanism is that ships have to report to, to the UN inspection mechanism before they enter Haleda Seaport, and a lot of ships don't report. So I'll just give you an example. Since last November, according to Yemeni government forces, 15 Iranian ships arrived in Hodeida seaport coming from Bandar Abbas seaport in Iran, and those were not inspected. Wow. They did not report to UNVEM uh, mechanism. So maybe, Evan, you could give us a little bit, I know you're in this business, uh, flagging ships. So the, one of the reasons we've invited you is because the Republic of the Marshall Islands flags a tremendous amount of ships that we use and other people use around the world. How does that work? I mean, so you, other countries have somebody flag this ship. And so even though it's flagged by Republic of Marshall Islands or some other entity, you really don't know still, um, you're supposed to know what the cargo manifest says or whatever, but um, there are laws about uh, what can be done to ships on international waters. Help explain uh, that to our audience just a, a little bit. Sure, so the, the flag state really the laws uh, of the flag state apply to that ship. Um, so uh, what what's good about a politically neutral flag, that's most of the, the large flags are, are more politically neutral, um, is you won't get target, targeted, but we've got some pretty smart um, adversaries now that can look at other parts of the ship. Um, ships are multinational and that's an understatement. I mean, they are because um, of the crews um, and the because of the ownership, <laughs> the crew, because of the flag, the crews, the ownership, okay. management, insurers, you name it. There's a and they're all probably different nationalities. So okay. um, they have been able to target or, or figure out research the owners or the cargo owners. Uh, there's a vessel owner and cargo owner um, that is a U.S. link or Israeli link, and it's fair game. But of course, we're looking at intelligence, trying to figure out, and in some cases we may know, well, these ships are coming from Iran, and so we want to be careful about what they might be carrying. In other cases, they're going to bypass that system somehow, and they're on some fishing boat that That's we right. have no idea where they came from, who's got flagged, they uh, relocated the target on multiple ships. So this is a very, very, very complicated and complex system. How crowded is the maritime traffic in the Red Sea? Well, it's down 60% since the Houthis started. It's, it's less, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely less. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know uh, the exact amount, uh, the okay. exact amount of traffic, but. How much of the world's goods uh, float through the Red Sea in terms of containerized traffic or? So they transit probably in both directions. Suez leads into the Mediterranean, but there are, there's a northern opening and southern mm -hmm. opening past the strait. Um, but how much of and what type of traffic goes through uh, these narrow seas and into the Red Sea and, and beyond? Yeah, sure. So about 12 to 15 percent of total um, world trade goes of through. Total world trade total, and global maritime trade. Yes, to, total maritime trade goes through the Red Sea, uh, you know, from Suez down to Babel Mandeb. And to put that in perspective, 90 percent of the world's goods or somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of, of all the world's goods are transported by ship. By, ship. by ship. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 10 to 12 percent of that entire global effort is transiting through the Red Sea in this narrow strait. Correct, but that's mm -hmm. made up of um, about 30 percent of container transits or, or traffic, um, 8 percent of LNG, I think like 8 percent of grain. Um, and I think 12% of oil. So bulk there. commodities, yeah. containerized vessels, mostly some energy transports probably, yeah. uh, LNG, maybe oil as well. Yeah, and LNG actually stopped completely going through there. We hadn't, haven't had an LNG ship go through since I believe January of this year. Hmm. But the first one uh, had a successful transit last week. So Is that because... LNG is ex very explosive in terms of it, if it does get hit. I mean, it, I mean, there have been accidents, very rare, but um, yeah, a lot that's of people, a big problem. Yeah, a lot of people think it's it's very volatile, and it is, but it's so cold LNG that 
the the jury's out on that. Yeah. Um, really, <laughs> it could be bad, it could be nothing. And have any tankers been hit uh, in terms of like oil spills or uh, from an environmental standpoint here yes. in the Red Sea? And definitely, um, we have Marlin Luanda, which yeah. is uh, under the Marshall Islands flag, uh, UK owned vessel. I uh, was hit by a ballistic missile and it was carrying naphtha, which is very volatile, mm -hmm. um, and burned for about a day. Uh, but they, they fought the fire for a day, didn't abandon ship, which... Remarkable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and, this uh, could have a severe economic, uh, not just economic, but environmental uh, no, without question, could. Yeah, problems. The, 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 the U.S. Navy helped responded to that by giving them uh, firefighting foam. Um, but going back to the point about um, end discrimination, I think that's what also um, is causing issues with the flow. Because the Houthis said several times have come out and specifically called out what vessel they wanted to attack. Right. And so come who, out. who are they uh, targeting? I mean, at least yeah, they, they say they're targeting <laughs> these sets, and yet uh, it looks like some of their attacks are indiscriminate. Very much so. And so we're, there's there's something moving, yeah, yeah. and we're going to shoot at it. Right. Um, but who are they mainly targeting? Uh, well, for the Houthis. Besides U.S. warships. Uh, yeah. Well, I think for the Houthis, these attacks are about projecting power. They okay. want to project themselves as a, a regional power, an international power in the mm -hmm. region. And that's why a lot of these attacks are not necessarily targeted towards specific. They say it's, it's, it's targeted towards Israel-linked um, ships, but Often I think it, it's not. Yeah, yeah. It's, a lot of and that Israeli link could be anything. Could be the owner, could be a particular portion of the cargo, <clears throat> could be crew members, could be supporters to Israel like the United States, <clears throat> any United States flag vessel or mm -hmm. anything connected to that. They would certainly target if they knew that that's what it was. Um, I think, um, again, you know, the more they hit, the more they make the headlines and that's what they want. Mm. And they're constantly changing the goalpost. I mean, they're moving the goalpost. So it used to be just Israelis. Then it was Israelis, Americans, and Brits. That's right. And now it's if like sister ships of ships that are going through the Red Sea that mm -hmm. are linked to Israel or have called in Israel. So um, they're running out of targets and they're expanding their. That's right. You know. What have been the impacts to containerized traffic? in the Red Sea. I mean, we talked about the percentage of global traffic, um, but how much has this slowed? You said that 60% of the uh, overall traffic has lessened because probably some ship owners are making calculated risk decisions about maybe taking a longer route uh, around Africa or somewhere else. Um, yeah, so there are, they're, they're, they're uh, rerouting around the Cape of Good Hope um, which, which is longer, costs more economically to mm -hmm. the consumer or mm -hmm. to the ship owner. Sure, it's a lot okay. more fuel oil, a lot more uh, shipping costs. But really the cost to the consumer is, is flattened out. It spiked in the beginning. Um, shipping is extremely resilient. Uh, we can get around anything, basically, if, if possible. Um, I think I read, though, that uh, there was uh, container spot rates, which is, I guess, the cost of containerized process, uh, has been rising, continues to rise, and is continued to expect to rise. And I think that a couple of you told me that uh, the, I guess, the commerce going through the Suez has been greatly affected, at least for Egypt and, and those mechanisms to get back and forth through the Suez. Yeah, so the Suez, I believe, is um, down 50%. So that's a lot of money for that lost, uh, that Egypt has lost. Mm -hmm. um, so, are, you know, what are, so if they continue this or if they escalate it, what are the long-term implications to global shipping, do you think? Um, could be that even fewer ships go, Suez goes down even farther. I mean, I remember when the container ship got stuck and it seemed like there was all sorts of growing economic reverberations, mm -hmm. kind of second and third order effects about so-and-so couldn't get this and stores were out of this. Um, could you see those type of effects over time or uh, do you think that we'll just continue to utilize Joe and his best friends to hopefully uh, keep this at bay and kind of manage it? What are the long-term implications? What are the worst possible long-term implications here for the global environment? Well, I think, in my opinion, um, the worst possible outcome could be 
if they succeed in shutting down uh, the route. And this is not economic, this is more, um, I wouldn't want anyone to emulate them. Uh, if they succeed here, you know, other, others will try to do the same thing in mm -hmm. other choke points. Um, so they can't succeed. Uh, I think that's the, but no, we don't want the, the Navy to have to protect uh, shipping forever. Um, it may not be really a long-term solution. I mean, yeah. it is expensive. Um, I think some of the ships there then are probably on high alert yeah. on a, almost a constant basis while they're in those waters, probably because they're going back and forth, That's escorting, right. you know, or looking for attacks. So, and they're being attacked themselves. And so there's a cost to deployment costs. I mean, we talk about the impact onto sailors and right. maintenance to the fleet. We have to put those ships into dry dock to reset them periodically, and, and we're a global Navy. That's right. Um, how long can we sustain, you know, is, and is this really a, a long-term prospect to try to manage this day-to-day -day yeah. for how long? No, I, I don't think we want this to be long-term, and I'll default to Nadwa. I thought her, her comment earlier was, was profound, like if the Houthis' goal is to use this to increase their stature on the global stage, when or why would they ever stop, right? So if, if that is the prospects, then we definitely have to, to reevaluate that. Um, because, I mean, so the, the point being, you know, when, when the war finally stops in Gaza and Israel, you know, withdraws, will the Houthis stop? You know, if that's their stated goal. But if not, if, they just, if they're continuing to do this because they want to increase their stature on the global stage, then we have a bigger problem. Yeah, this is challenging our force readiness, but the U.S. Navy, you, you know, been wholly impressed uh, by, by my brothers and sisters out there on the waterfront and just how successful we've been. And it's just a testament to the investments that we've made over the last decade or so, the training and the, and the recruitment and, and how we are preparing our forces before they go on deployment with through exercises and training. So. Um, um, I, I, yes, we can keep this up, but do we want to keep this up for longer, longer, longer? I mean, our job is to, uh, you know, ensure the free flow of commerce, and we're not going to see that battle space. We're not and going to let them shut down that strait. And but we've uh, we've seen. The, I mean, this is the first time that the Navy has had extensive combat type of operations. I mean, we're not yeah. fighting another Navy, but it's a, a significant non-state actor that right. is attacking U.S. warships. Yeah, you'd have to go back to um, World War II to find the last time that we've been at this pace of operations with somebody shooting at us and us actively shooting down those weapons. And it's a very complicated back. system. I mean, I've been out on an aircraft carrier. The system itself and all it's designed to do is an amazing set of systems. Um, and I'm sure that's true of even operating in that kind of defensive um, and offensive environment bubble that is being enacted on a daily, hourly basis. That's right. That's right. Let's talk maybe the three of you for a minute about what's really at stake here. And uh, Nadwa, I'll turn back to you for a minute. Um, so it's not just about the amount of ships that go through. Um, what else is really at stake if we can't manage this or if we have to continue to manage it at the pace that we're doing now or they get more weapons? and continue to escalate the, this type of attack in the Red Sea. What's, it, what's, it, what's really at stake when we come down to think about it? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the worst case scenario is if the Houthis manage to take Yemen and they're, they're gearing up for escalation within Yemen right now. Uh, they have been uh, for the past two years, uh, at least. Um, the Houthis objective and that they share with Iran and proxies is to evict the U.S. from the region. Um, and this is a war of attrition. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not going to stop. I don't think they will stop if the Gaza war ends because now and for the past 20 years, the Houthis um, say they're, they're at war with America and Israel. I mean, their logo is death to America, death to Israel. Um, and so um, that's what at stake is that the U.S. is forced out of the region. Now there is, you know. Um, and uh, that we, so at the symposium, we had uh, Dr. Till there, and I think he made the point um, that perhaps, because you've mentioned Iran and what their ambitions are, the United States and the allies of the United States have constructed what we usually refer to as the international rules-based order, which includes the free flow of global commerce on the high seas. Mm -hmm. And that trade is important to the whole functioning of the global system. Um, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran as a set 
are normally considered revisionist powers. They would like to see some change to that global order, to yeah. that global system. Is this really an attack on the system itself? Absolutely, yes. That's one of the one of Iran and the Houthis' goal is to change the world order ev eventually, um, and you know, in time, establish their own Islamic government. Uh, and in how, the how much mm -hmm. um, if, uh, how much leverage does Iran have over the Houthis? Um, so the Houthis are not Iran puppets, and that's very important to understand because. Um, Diplomats uh, have been going to Iran to try to pressure the Houthis, but Iran has empowered the Houthis enough to act on their own. And the Houthis have ambition even beyond, you know, beyond being part of axis of resistance. They want to see themselves as the leaders of the mm -hmm. axis of resistance. Um, and so they, they need to be treated as such. So then let's talk about um, short, long-term desired outcomes. Um, so obviously the first one is that we desire that the Houthis stop firing missiles onto ships in the Red Sea. So if we could either prevent that by interdicting the supply chain mm -hmm. or uh, attacking sites, launch sites, or move them farther back from the coast perhaps, those would be short-term immediate goals. objectives is certainly yeah. what we're trying to do now, right? Mm -hmm. I would agree with that, yeah. Uh, significantly reduce or if not completely stop the attacks that are going on right now. I think, you know, there's been a, I wouldn't say recent shift, but, you know, this all started out, how, how do we deter the Houthis from doing what they're doing? Uh, and we quickly realized that that, that, was not the, that was not the immediate goal. The goal was to assure shipping and our partners that they could freely flow through that strait. And so you use the word deterrence. Yeah, yeah. Um, can the Houthis be detoured as a, because they have this religious ideology, which I think to them then would believe that they're doing God's work, and yeah. therefore whether they get killed or not, they That's don't right. want to stop that. So normally deterrence is with a more a non-religious, usually, uh, yeah. actor that is going to change their behavior because we're adding pressure. And that may not be possible yeah. in this case. Is yeah, I, I think we need to be strategic. We've, we've, we've never been strategic. Um, uh, on this case and other cases, but I'll, I'll speak to this case. Um, the U.S. response to the Houthis have been reactionary, um, short term. I Iran and the Houthis are long term. So Iran has seen its investment in the Houthis, 40 years of investment in the Houthis materialized in the Red Sea attacks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the power of the Houthis is growing, really, yes. because they're taking over it didn't more happen, of the country. But it didn't happen overnight. Right. Right. It took a long time to build their capabilities, but it took consensus, consistency as well. Um, the U.S. forced the Yemeni, the U.S. and the U.N. forced the Yemeni government and the Saudi-led coalition to stop the, the, the taking Hulida seaport from the Houthis, to abort the, the, the uh, uh, taking, taking the port from the Houthis. And back then, a lot of Yemenis, including myself, were warning that that was a big mistake and that will lead the Houthis to threaten international shipping and regional security. And that's exactly what happened five years depends. later. Um, and so I think we need to be more strategic. Um, the Houthis respect power. And we've, we've been doing diplomacy for 10 years We've exhausted diplomacy. I'm not saying diplomacy is not a good option. It should continue to be the first option. But at the same time, the Houthis continue to escalate. So and militarily, so just to be clear, the Saudis have been the Saudis with have the Yemenis in a war against the Houthis. They've been attacked. We've, there's been many missile strikes, air strikes onto Houthi forces, yep. which has also oh, not decades. stopped them mm -hmm. from their political ambitions or their yeah. growing power. Really. Yeah, but the Saudis well, the Saudis themselves came under a lot of attacks by the Houthis. The Houthis missiles and drones have over 800 missiles and drones inside Saudi mm -hmm. attack uh, infrastructure, oil infrastructure, mm -hmm. including Aramco. And that sort of forced the Saudis to, um, you know, and officially end their military intervention in Yemen. Since April 2022, the Saudis have been out of Yemen militarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they've been negotiating a deal with the Houthis to extricate themselves from Yemen and kind of focus on their domestic economic goal, which is Vision 2030. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, the Houthis feel emboldened. And, and the Houthis have learned the skill of using force 
violence to sort of extract concessions. They managed to do that with the UN, they managed to do that with the Saudis and the Emiratis, and now they're trying to do that also with the U.S. and the international community. You know, it seems to me that uh, it re this reminds me a little bit about, uh, like, uh, Fehrenbach uh, wrote this book, at, you know, about the Korean War, very famous passages from that book. Um, was that you can fly over a piece of territory and bomb it forever, but unless you put force on the ground, you can't change it politically. Yeah. And, of course, what you're describing is the fact that what really needs to happen over time is that the political situation in Yemen has to change, and if it doesn't, then the Houthis' power is liable to continue to grow vis-a-vis -vis the government, and then these attacks in the Red Sea and that are affecting all of us and allies and partners in the maritime industry will continue. The problem, I think, for the United States and others is that we have had bad experiences with um, force intervention, um, putting yeah. force on the ground, yeah. and the difficulties that um, ensue from that. And so we probably aren't really uh, wouldn't be very excited about putting U.S. troops or forces into Yemen itself, and yet we need a local partner, which is probably the national Yemenese government. Mm -hmm. it, it, without that, I mean, what do we have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we would not want U.S. boots on the ground. Let me just state that. Mm -hmm. I would not right. want that. I think it would be counterproductive, but we do and have... politically infeasible, I think. Yes, I yes. I um, and it, yeah, and it will, leave, it will only reinforce the Houthis narrative that the U.S. has been fighting them for decades, um, fighting Yemen. So uh, we do have a Yemeni government in place. It's not perfect. It's not strong, but there are Yemeni forces on the ground. Um, and with enough support and weapons, they could, they could weaken the Houthis militarily. I think what we need is to sort of, we need the Houthis to get to a point where they feel that violence and military escalation is not their best yeah. alternative. And that's not the case right now. So, so diplomatically, why not uh, convene, I mean, we talked a little bit about this in one of the working groups that we had at Symposium. Um, why not convene a, a summit with many of the local uh, regional players and determine a way forward that's more strategic, that would support a political outcome, um, that would threaten what is important to the Houthis. If you don't have leverage and they're interested in territory and in power, it seems to me that um, we're kind of putting a Band-Aid on this. It's an exquisite Band-Aid, and we've been very successful at it uh, in these localized time pockets. Mm -hmm. But for us to do this forever, mm -hmm. or if those attacks, you know, heaven forbid, were to sink a U.S. warship, then this whole game will change yeah. uh, on a massive scale. Yeah. That that would that would definitely change things, um, you know, in a very unfortunate direction. And that would help, I think, informationally as a narrative as well that. Perhaps other countries, uh, you know, we, there are countries that could be involved in, uh, and local forces have done some advisory work. I know the UAE has done some advisory work in Yemen. Saudi has obviously been involved because they're, they have a problematic border yeah. uh, with Yemen, and there's a lot of Yemenis. And, um, I mean, so I'm, I'm just thinking about other kinds of, outcomes uh, that are policy recommendations that we could think about. So, I mean, diplomatically, that's one. Um, are there other things that we could do either militarily or, um, uh, or economically? Um, what could be done economically in the country to try to leverage against the Houthis? Well, I think this, you know, the Saudis are very important to this because the Saudis okay. will always be involved in Yemen. That's just a reality, whether we like it or not. And so... Because they, they have that border. Because they have that border. border. We, you know, we share a lot with the Saudis. Um, and, uh, you know, the U.S. has not been consistent with the Saudis. For, for the first eight years of the war, the, the U.S. has been pressuring the Saudis to sort of and their military intervention in Yemen, even though they were selling, selling weapons to the Saudis, but they were backing a UN peace process that sort of put pressure on the Saudis to end their military intervention, and that led to the Stockholm Agreement in 2018, and that benefited the Houthis. Um, and now the U.S. is kind of frustrated why the Saudis are trying to make peace with the Houthis and extricate themselves from, from, from Yemen. I think the U.S. and the Saudis need to be on, on, um, on the same page 
um, in, in Yemen right now, it's not the case. Mm -hmm. And I think the U.S. need to reassure the Saudis. Um, because you know, since, since the Iran deal, the Saudis have been feeling you know, that the U.S. is, is not a, a reliable partner. Um, so, you know, I mean, diplomacy is good, but diplomacy without teeth is not, is not enough. Mm -hmm. See, okay. Especially with actors like the Houthis who absolutely refuse to de-escalate, who reject, um, they, they don't recognize the Yemeni government altogether. Um, but in order for some of the things that you're uh, thinking about, and by the way, I, I thought some of your comments on one of our workshops about the banks, the telecommunications, particularly you yes. know, from the north could be moved maybe to the south. But all of that, and, and whether or not I mean, we, we see Ukraine, we see this effort to arm Ukraine, even though we're not putting people in. The peace process, though, restricts us, really, from arming yeah. the Yemeni's government mm. against the Houthis. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, the Article 2016, uh, the UN Resolution 2216, prevents arming the Yemeni government, and I think that should change. Mm. Um, because Would the, we have to end because the, the Houthis are being armed every day, right. and right. so would we have in, to end the peace process in order to change um, the policy? I wouldn't say end the peace process. I mean, the peace process has been in a sort of de facto pause since at least 2016, definitely since 2018, um, and to me, it's dead. But I think it should always be there. But at the same time, we need to be realistic and prepare. Mm -hmm. We need to work for peace, but we need to prepare for escalation mm -hmm. so because some, the Houthis are. But there's definitely policy issues that would have to be confronted yeah. in order Absolutely. for us to get a, a regional change. Right? I Absolutely. want to turn to Evan and, and, and Captain Baggett for a minute, too. But So there was another comment uh, and a dialogue that came up in one of the workshops that we had at symposium yesterday that militarily... Uh, we could possibly do convoy operations instead of the type of operations. I mean, we've got a couple of ships there on any given day yeah. running up and down, trying to do too much in some ways, um, sometimes difficult, if not control, coordination with the ships that are supposed to be going with them. And if something happens, it's not quite like convoy operations where you would have a specific time, everybody would kind of be under the command of a convoy leader. I mean, we saw that in the Battle of the Atlantic. We've seen successful convoy yeah. operations. They are costly as well. I think we'd need an international maritime force to help with that. What do the two of you think in terms of assuring our allies or to protect shipping? Would that be uh, something that we should think about developing? I mean, it, that's a complicated military operation. but. Joe, what do you think? Yeah, so I think uh, that's largely underway now. Uh, maybe not full-blown convoy operations, but uh, a couple of months ago we shifted to exactly what you're just talking about, and it's uh, establishing a protective umbrella, if you will, warship in front, uh, two to three merchant vessels in the middle, and a warship behind them, right? So now the warships are mutually supportive of one another. And you and have kind of vessels. a bubble that you can kind of move exactly. everybody mm -hmm. through exactly. more safely. Exactly. You could do it at certain times. They have difficulty operating at night, perhaps, maybe, yeah. with some but of their technology. The coordination yeah. piece is, is, okay. is, is a challenge, as you highlighted, right. uh, but things that were uh, that the, the team out there continues to work through on a daily basis, but that is one way to get after this militarily and continue to assure, to your point, shift from deterrence to assuring our allies and partners that it's safe to, to operate. Now, we had Commodore Fryer there that I, I know you know he was the deputy commander yeah. uh, for Admiral Cooper uh, in at NAVSENT. Um, he talked about, I think he was in command of the Combined Maritime Force. He t I think he said there was, that's the largest international maritime mm -hmm. force. Could we use more international warships to help with this kind of effort and coordinate that as a larger process to prevent these type of attacks over, over time? Well, my, my concern is really capacity. I mean, is it, we don't have enough ships to take all the traffic through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is about the volume of shipping as right. well. Okay. Yeah, and especially if they go back to trading through the Red Sea. So it's um, or the or the ships could choose. I want. I'm not going to leave. I will wait until convoy uh, effort is available, or I'm going to take my chances without the convoy, and I'm I'm going to continue to push through with these other ships up here and hope that I don't get targeted. Yeah, we could see that. I mean, what from what I've heard from both navies, uh, well. EU NAVFOR and the, and the U.S. and U.K., um, they're referring to it as a accompaniment or yeah. loose accompaniment. Yeah. Um, 
I guess that just means a little further away <laughs> from uh, than actually escorting. Um, convoys are a little different. I don't I don't believe we've done too many of them no, yet. So. Full blown convoys. But well, we haven't done them since uh, one of the recent wars. Right, I mean, right. you know, we've it's been a while since we've done it. Although navies typically don't like to do it because it it requires a lot of naval presence yeah. to do it. Yeah which would probably mean a, a maritime task force of an international flavor. Yeah, well, to your so. point, just the volume of shipping makes it very challenging to do, which is what, you know, I think, again, Operation Prosperity Guardian and, and the success of that is bringing in the other countries and other nations um, into the fight. Um, I think, you know, by the time I left, it was in the mid-20s of nations that had signed on to that to provide either ships or planners or intel or something uh, in support of uh, the operations going on there and uh, <clears throat> maybe getting ourselves to the point if we get enough shipping in the area to do sort of the zone defense, if you will, right? Enough ships along the area so a ship could safely pass through. So, Evan, what, just the last couple of comments, and we'll close this out in a minute. But uh, so ships come into the Red Sea. Who do they coordinate with? I mean, do they, you know, they're not talking to Joe's warship necessarily. They just arrive. And, you know, I, I assume there's some tracking of maritime shipping of who's coming in. Who do they coordinate with if they want protection or assistance? How does that work? So they should be coordinated with their flag, but it's actually very <laughs> difficult right now because there is not a one single um, reporting center or reporting. So you don't go to the front desk and you know, say, <laughs> yeah, you help me with right. this problem. There's, right. there's no 911. <laughs> there are multiple 911s. There's, um, you know, the IMB, the, the, um, all the navies, all the different navies. Um, and the flag state. So they've got to report to UKMTO, yep. MSC HOA, um, NAVCENT, or yep. NCAG, yep. uh, the flag, IMB. So there's there's way too many right now for our, a master to, and, and, and talk about when he gets attacked, um, he's got you know five or six numbers to call. It, yeah. it doesn't make sense right now. Yeah. So we've got to simplify that. Yeah, the command and control is challenging out there, which is why we stood up uh, Command Task Force 153 to help get after that. But to your point, there's still the, the number, the, the amount of people mm -hmm. that, that uh, they have to report to. Well, this is a fascinating topic. And like I said, it's probably, um, you talk about currency. I mean, this is happening while we're talking about it. And uh, it's a very difficult um, problem. There's a tremendous number of parameters that are complicating all of the situation from military to diplomatic uh, to, di uh, to the, to the uh, strategic orientation to the industry aspects. I appreciate you coming and talking with us. Uh, why don't we go around the room for our last comments and uh, I'll start with Joe and then we'll move to Nadwa and end with Evan. No. So, uh, Joe, any last thoughts or comments to yeah, our audience about this? No, Dan, I just want to say thank you again for inviting me here and being part of this. Uh, I think this is, uh, you know, the, the, the symposium that you put on for the last two days, you know, with the workshops and the, and the minds here at this table today is, is how we're going to get after this, is how we're going to solve this. I call it a complex problem. This has gone beyond complicated. This is a, a complex problem. problem. This right? is a wicked, wicked problem. problem. That's right, but it takes these, these, uh, these minds from academia, from, from industry, from military, from policy to figure out how we're going to get out of this. It's going to take every element of the dime uh, in order for us to solve this problem. But, again, it's just been an honor and, and, a, and a really professional rewarding for me to be a part of this. Uh, I thank you. Well, it's, I think it's great that uh, you've just come back from – doing this exact work and, and you are now commanding the, the school that is training our surface warfare officers and I think that couldn't be um, better suited. So, thank you. Nadwa. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me again. Uh, I think, you know, the Houthis are a long-term threat to, um, to Yemen, to the region, to U.S. interests in the region and to, world, to the world order and I think it's time to stop dealing with the Houthis um, you know, by wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be realistic. We need to stop reacting to what the Houthis are doing. We need to uh, be, a little, be a little more proactive and we need to be strategic. Uh, without that, things could go wrong and, and in no time and we might, if, if the Houthis take him, it will be too little too late to do anything about, um, about that threat. And so I'm asking people to be strategic. Evan, last thoughts. Well, um, first, I just like on behalf of the industry, I want to 
say we're extremely grateful for the, for what the navies are doing to uh, to protect us. We don't want this to be long term. Uh, we are trying to think of ways to protect ourselves. It's very difficult in this situation, um, but but we love working with the navy, and that's a recent thing. Really collaborating industry and navy. Um, it's not something we've done in the past, and we don't know too much about each other. So the fact that we're getting together now and learning is uh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. Well, this topic uh, couldn't be more timely, and having military, scholarly, and industry experts at the symposium and here today is tremendously informative, and we very much appreciate uh, you joining us for this special edition of the Trident, the Bob L. Mondeb Strait in the Red Sea. If you were unable to attend our recent symposium, Exploring Maritime Strategies, the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Uh, this has been an excellent, informative discussion with these experts on one of the most impactful situations on the seas today. And Nadwa, Evan, and Captain Baggett, I would truly appreciate your expertise and your insights on this extraordinarily important topic. Thank you very much.